I want to welcome one of my dear, dear friends uh, to, uh, to here. This is Douglas Rushkoff. Hey. Well, thanks for having me. It's a, um, it's a little strange because I'm, I'm basically running around the country d demanding, uh, demanding people become basically uh, digitally literate. So it's, a, it's an odd argument to make at the, the center of digital literacy of the, perhaps the universe. But, um, but I'll make it anyway. Um, and I'll make it in a way that I think is, is, is specific um, to you all. Um, my, my main message to you guys as on the humans, uh, you know, please don't give up on, on the masses, on the, the general public's ability to understand what's going on. Um, another way of saying that is don't, um, don't surrender um, entirely to usability um, just for their own, for their own ease and, and momentary and temporary comfort. Um, I think that the, the opportunity cost for us as a, as a civilization is really, is really too great. Um, you guys know, as, as, as I do to a lesser extent, um, that, that computers are essentially anything machines. I mean, those of us who were introduced to computers in the 70s, as I was, um, you know, we were introduced to computers with no software. We didn't know what software was. There was just a computer, and then you would decide to make it do something. So I, I was introduced to this technology thinking of computers as anything machines. And that experience changed the way I looked at everything else. No, every, everything I looked at after that became a discussion, became an argument, became something that was up for grabs. After I had played with BASIC for the first time, I looked at the New York City streets and said, oh my gosh, this is a grid pattern, not because cities grow up into grids, but because someone at some point in history decided to make this a grid. And for a 12 or 13 year old, that's, that's a profound moment, and it's a moment that most people don't have very often, if at all, in their lives. Over the last 25, 30 years, I've watched this possibility, the possibility for computers and digital technology to open people's minds to the idea that reality itself is a program, or a heck of a lot more of it is programmed as software than we like to admit, um, I've watched that realization completely disappear from the user experience. And I feel like the window of opportunity offered by digital technology, a window of opportunity as big as the invention of text, as big as perhaps the invention of language, is being lost as people get further and further away from the actual technology on offer and less and less capable of actually using these machines. You know, I really, I, I, I believe it in a literal sense, although I don't generally admit it in public. When I say program or be programmed, I don't mean this just as a metaphor. I mean it literally. I do believe that programming is the base. They will be programmed by others. You know, hopefully by other people, but at worst case by the machines that other people, that other people embed with programs in some, in some history. You know, I look at the invention of language, terrific thing, but people didn't just learn how to listen, they learned how to speak, right? Look at the invention of text. People didn't learn just how to read, they learned how to write. And now we get the invention of digital technologies and people learn how to use them, but not how to program them, as if, and this is the argument they make, as if, well, I can drive a car, but I don't know how to fix the engine. As if the relationship between the user and programmer of a piece of technology was that of a driver and an auto mechanic. But it's not the relationship of a driver and an auto mechanic, it's the relationship of the driver and the passenger. Right? I'm not asking that people know how to open up their computers and replace the 
power supply or fix the screen luminescence. I'm asking that they understand how to use the machine. You know, to use a computer is to program. And I get that this is going to fall on deaf ears for now. The only arguments so far that have had traction out in public are the Chinese are teaching programming in public school and Americans aren't, that the, the quotes I have from generals of the, 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 in the Army and the Air Force saying they can't get recruits who know how to program anymore, and that our, our technological superiority is falling behind. You know, General Elder of the Air Force Cyber Command said one generation and it's all over. I mean, generals aren't supposed to talk like that, not, not to journalists anyway. I feel like people look at the digital technologies that they, that they receive from the perspective of consumers. You know, they, 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 they know, they, they wanna know what can this thing do rather than what can I make it do. And that's, that's, I would argue it's not just a, uh, uh, it's not just a pity, but it's dangerous in terms of uh, their agency and their ability, their ability to function, their ability to actually be participant human beings in, in a digital age. Now, the simplest way for me to argue this, um, I guess both to you and to the public, is that people will get better results with technology if they know what the technologies they're using are for. Right? It's sort of, it sounds ultra simple, but it's actually a complex idea for most people. If, if people know what the tools they're using have been programmed to do, they're going to get more predictable results with them. Right? I see, I see educators, governments, politicians, businesses getting very, uh, uh, getting results with their technologies very different than what they expected to get or working against whatever their interests are. And usually that's because they don't know what the tool they're using has been made to do. And often they'll, they'll think like they, they have some problem. Like there's a, um, in the education world, there's this awful but brilliant piece of software called, um, um, what's it called, Blackboard? Have you seen this thing? It's what universities use, most of them now, for their sort of courses and how, now Blackboard, from the student or the teacher's perspective, Blackboard is terrible, right? It's, got, it's just awful. You run up consistently against these just terrible obstacles and extremely difficult things, ways that you've gotta wrap your whole self and brain and course and life around what this program needs from you in order to comply with it. And most of us look and say, ugh, oh, this is just an awful thing. This software is awful. If you look at it from what I'm calling the programmer's perspective, you see, oh no, Blackboard is brilliant. Because Blackboard wasn't written for me. Blackboard wasn't written for me as an educator or for that person as a student. Blackboard was written for the Blackboard company to dominate education in a very particular way. Blackboard was created to help create an equivalence between distance learning and real life learning so that in your classroom you're actually using this technology as much as you would long distance. It's, it's created just like the old school, remember sticky websites? It's created not to promote the user's agency but to decrease the user's agency and to increase the school or the institution's dependence on this piece of software. And for that, it's really smart. Now I thought, and I wrote my early books very, very um, uh, uh, optimistically about youth. You know, I thought that once the generation that was 12 or 13 years old when I was writing, you know, Mamie's generation, once they got to in their 20s and 30s, once they're starting to run things, everything will be okay. Because these people are what I call digital natives. And unlike us digital immigrants who were raised in the analog world, the digital natives are gonna be able to surf this terrain, you know, like, like, like natives, like native speakers. They will see through all of these programmatic attempts to, you know, to repress their consciousness and they'll be able to tell the difference between ads and editorial and see what's coercion and what's, actual, what's actually truth. And 
as you guys probably know, I mean, the data is in. Young people are way, way worse at discerning between valid information and crap online, at, at negotiating between sources and, and, and reputable material. Um, and I had to have a good, long, hard think about why, in, at least in this one area, um, I was completely wrong. And the reason, the reason this happened, I believe, is because kids grew up with digital media as a given circumstance. Kids grew up with it as, as if it were a fact of nature. The same way I grew up with the grid pattern in New York as the way to do, I just thought that was city. I mean, imagine if you woke up in a world where there was only Microsoft Windows running all the laptops out there. If it, you wouldn't know what an operating system was if there was only one operating system, right? You wouldn't know, right? So likewise, they don't know the alternatives. They look at each thing as if it was made to do the thing that its makers are telling us it's there to do. I mean, talk to anybody under 17 and ask them, what is Facebook for? What will they tell? They'll tell you, Facebook is here to help me make friends. Right? And what is Facebook for? Go to the boardroom if they have one. I mean, go to the boardroom at Facebook and what are they doing? What is Facebook for? Facebook is there to help companies monetize the connections, the relationships between young people, or to create what they're calling social marketing opportunities. I mean, what, what is it for is not what it's for, right? What it's for is something different, you know, which just comes back to program or be programmed. But if they're not gonna program, if they're not gonna learn to program, then at least what I want people to know is what the tools they're using are for. And the easiest way for them to do that is either for us all to be completely transparent about what it is we're doing, but even if we are, how can they tell the people who are being honest and transparent from the people who are, be, who are creating opaque and dishonest interfaces? They, they'd have no way of knowing. So what, what I thought instead as, as a basic and, and a kind of McLuhan-esque um, McLuhan approach to digital media is what I would do is teach people the very basic biases of digital media. In other words, what if Aristotle were around today and rather than writing a poetics of Greek tragedy, were writing a poetics of new media, a poetics of digital media? What if McLuhan were around today and instead of looking at electronic media and the biases of electronic compared with textual media, what if he were looking at digital media? Well, what these people would do is look at what are the main features, textures, biases of this technology, both on, on a core level, in other words, on an actual level from the way the technology works, and then how does that, um, how does that bias then scale up and inform the way we interact on it, right? So if you look at um, something say, and this isn't one of my uh, uh, 10 biases, but you look at how every uh, uh, online conversation or every conversation about the internet tends to polarize into good, bad, right? There's sort of the Nick Carr, oh, the shallows and Google's making us stupid and all that, or you get the, you know, the, the Jeff Jarvis or the, the, the Clay Shirky side, oh, it's all great and we all have cognitive surplus and the human organism is going to rise to this next level and the amateurs are coming and who needs that and we're quashing the entire centralized corporate structure of, of locks on data and learning and yay. I mean, but there's like no middle, right? Where does that come from? I would argue as a media theorist that comes from the basically polar nature of binary media. You know, of plus minus, yes, no, make your choice. The fact that this media is biased towards this, uh, uh, is biased towards binary, uh, a binary logic, which then leads to polar conversations, which then polarizes the political landscape, that, that things spin out. You get your great sort of Godwin's laws about people calling each other Nazis and then the conversation ending. You know, but when you understand that, you go, well, that's only natural that our approaches, that our feelings, our emotions about technology are going to polarize really quickly. You know, and that's why, for, for me, it's much less important, and I think these are great writers, and, you know, and Kevin Kelly, who's coming next week, I think he's written the best book on this, uh, on this score. Everybody is really so busy writing about what is technology doing to us? What is digital technology doing to us? What is Google doing to us? And I, and I, am, I so don't care about what technology is doing to us. I care about what are we doing to one another through technology? 
right? Technology is not doing anything to you, right? It's people that are doing things to you, at least for the time being, right? Because these things, believe it or not, you know that they're made by people in rooms. They make the code. These are human creation, you know, at least for the time being, until you, you create the code that can really recode itself beyond, you know, then we go, we go nano, robotic, digital, and genetic. You know, we create the codes that code themselves. Uh, but even if we do that, we should do it carefully. So because people can't or won't learn programming, because they won't take two weeks and learn scratch, right? Because they won't do Lego Mindstorms, because they think it's too much of a mathematical challenge, because they've forgotten long division and don't want to be reminded that they don't know what an algorithm is, we aren't going to teach this generation, the next generation, or probably the next generation, how to program as a basic literacy skill. You know, it took human beings 2,000 years to decide to learn the 22-letter alphabet, right? It was elites, it was rabbis and priests and kings who knew how to do that, even though, what does it take? You know, it, it takes your kindergarten year to learn what that alphabet is, and then you can read. Um, it took people a long time to get that. It'll take them a long time to get this, too. So in the meantime, I thought I would give them simple biases. And I'm going to show you a few of these, less because you need to know these biases, but because I think the way, the way I've, I've, I've come up with the biases and share them um, I think is a valuable way of looking at media and, and at expressing media to people who don't necessarily understand it. Um, so this is a really simple one, time, right? For me, I'm looking at now each of these, each of these what I'm calling commands of, of a digital age, sort of uh, uh, analogs to the commandments of the, of the beginning of the axial or literate age. Um, each one's based on one axis and then has a bias. So the axis here would be the axis of time. And then I'm looking at how is digital media biased with respect to time? And I would argue digital technology is biased outside of time. The digital technology is biased towards asynchronous activity and asynchronous behavior. And partly that's, and maybe coding has changed since then, but in basic and C and the programming languages I learned, these are sequenced events. The Step 10, step 20, step 30, step 40, and the computer sits and waits until it gets the input to go on to step 50. Whether the input's coming from another machine or whether the input's coming from a person, it's going to sit and wait, and it's going to treat it the same, no matter how many cycles it took to get there. So computers are living outside time, and I think that's why human activities that work well on computers are ones that are similarly asynchronous. The early conversations I had with People like Howard Rheingold and Stuart Brand and Kevin Kelly on something we called the well, Whole Earth Electronic Link. This was an asynchronous conversation environment. Right? And what made it so special was that you had more time to think about what you were going to say than you did in the real world. Right? You'd turn on your computer, you'd, you'd plug it into this um, something called a modem that would then dial into the internet. You would download the entire conversation onto your computer. You would disconnect from the internet, you would read the conversation, think about how you wanted to reply or participate in it, then you type a few paragraphs of what you actually felt and then you'd upload it, maybe the next morning, maybe two days later. The weird thing about the net was you actually had more time online to think about your response, your participation in a conversation than you did in real life. So you didn't need to be all witty like a Christopher Hitchens or someone. You didn't need to have those comebacks. You were actually, it was as if you were as smart as those people who could come back with those fast answers, even though you could do it slow. It was like chess by mail. Right? You had as long as you wanted to come up with something. Now what happens when we take an asynchronous medium and attach it to ourselves in an always-on fashion? I would argue then we're working against the bias of the medium. Right? So now we take an iPhone or what a Blackberry or whatever it is, put it on our body, take an asynchronous medium like email and turn it into a synchronous medium like the telephone. And we wonder why people start exhibiting the same symptoms as air traffic controllers and 911 operators. You know, why people get what we now call phantom vibration syndrome, where you think your phone or your Blackberry is vibrating on your thigh even though it's on your desk. You know, that is not adaptation. That's called maladaptation, right? That is, that is a, a, a nervous system glitch. It is, that's essentially bad for you, is what I would argue. And it's because you're not using the technology according to its bias, right? You're trying to work against the bias. And then you don't end up getting the strength of that media. I mean, another really simple one is distance. The bias of dis on the axis of 
place or distance, I would argue digital media is biased towards long distance, not up close distance, as is any medium, right? The first text, when you wrote a message down, the idea was now I could leave a message for you saying, sorry, I killed your cat. Leave it as a message and I can be somewhere else when he reads it, right? That's part of why we got Torah and Bible and all those laws is because of the impact of, of text, of, of text as a technology on culture, on people, on the way they looked at God, they turned it into a contract, all this other stuff. So this is not new to digital media. You know, television is another great long distance technology. Television literally means what? Remote viewing. Digital technology, likewise, is a great long distance technology to send packets to someone far away. It's a really bad up close technology. Right? But, and they praise Google while they do it, I've walked into universities. The University of Tennessee was the last one where they had students who lived on campus, right, and went to the same classroom. They would come to a classroom, sit in the classroom, log on to computers, log into Second Life, and then engage together in a virtual simulation of their classroom. And this wasn't a computer class. This was a model United Nations class that they had done every year as a model United Nations in a room together, and now they were doing it in Second Life together. And no, they didn't invite anyone from the public to come into that Second Life room. There weren't any kids in wheelchairs stuck in their dorm rooms who got to participate because long distance, there was no distance learning aspect to it. It was only people in the same room who could get into the same Second Life room. Right? And I go to that, and the kids are, I mean, in this case, they were smarter. They were looking at me going, this is pretty sick, isn't it? I mean, we're paying all this money. We get to this school. We got, we're all the way here, and now we're, we're doing this. And the teacher afterwards is like, so we're putting this on the cover of the course catalog this year to show how we're up with the cyber age. Right? I've, I, and it's, it's one of, of hundreds of examples of people using these technologies up close. There's, this is my first PowerPoint presentation I ever made, and I did it just because I had hired this comic artist to make pictures. But I've been hired to do talks, I've arrived at them, and they've been horrified that I don't have PowerPoint to show. You know, they've shipped a warm body four, five, 6,000 miles across the world to speak to a group. And because I don't have PowerPoint, they're almost not gonna let me go on. They're calling my speaking agent. This is a breach of contract. What are you gonna do? He came without slides. I'm like, if you wanna show, I could stay in New York and send my slides, right? And you, I can have a better mic. It'll all, what do you need me for? They need, they need the slides to prove, God knows what's happened. Right, so they have no more respect for this thing. They've lost track of the fact that 93% of human communication is nonverbal. Right, that there's all this bandwidth, stuff we don't even barely know about. You know, all the mirror neurons, like he's nodding a little bit, so my mir mirror neurons in my brain go, oh, good, 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 release some endorphins, stay on that line. There's all this shit going, so I'm, oh, sorry, ooh. <laughs> stuff, nonverbal stuff going on that we lose. So we end up living in this, in this um, and nothing against people with Asperger's, but we all end up with Asperger's-like symptoms when we're in virtual spaces communicating through language. Think about the questions you asked. What did he mean by that text? I don't really know. Did he mean this like this? That's the situation of somebody who can't read verbal cues, who, who has that social discomfort because they don't, that's what it feels like, right? And that's why we behave the way we do in these spaces. Right, so it's simple stuff like that. Then sometimes they get a little more complex, like choice. Right, digital spaces are biased towards choice, and that's really because you've got to make a decision. I always get in trouble with um, uh, uh, recording engineers. I was a recording engineer too in my day, though, and the difference between an analog and a digital recording basically is choice. At some point in the digital recording, we must choose how to represent this notationally, symbolically, in terms of a number. Right? Whereas with, with analog recording, you don't actually make that conscious choice. The, the granularity of choice is dictated by the granularity of the medium, by the wax or the, the iron filings, uh, the, the, the iron particles on the tape. Right? But when you're picking your color in Adobe Color 
picker, right? It's either going to be, you know, your blue is going to be 0.0021 or 0.0022. It's not going to be in between those two unless you go out another digit. Then you're making a choice about how many digits you go out and then 0.0125 or 0.0126, right? It's everything in the digital space is basically a snap to grid in one way or another, right? You're here or you're here. You're here or you're here, right? You're not here, right? And you can't be. Right? Their choice has to be made. If you're going to go on Facebook, you know, are you married or single? Are you looking or not looking? Are you this or that? Not just binary choices, but choices. In the end, to have a database in a traditional sense, you've got to make a predetermined series of choices for the user. Not that this is a bad thing, not that the, the engineer thinks, oh, I'm going to box those people into my categories of humans, but you've got to make a choice in order to negotiate with digital representations, at least for now. And I'm arguing you can always choose none of the above, that you don't have to define yourself in terms of those choices. For me, the most dangerous thing about Facebook is not the destruction of social relationships, but the destruction of identity. The fact that people are using, young people are using Facebook as a mirror, and they're tweaking their, their uh, what is it called, your, their pages, you know, they're, as if they're tweaking their identity, as if they're this is me, you know, oh, I'll get a side, okay, no, I like this book instead of that one, you know, and each little thing, when that becomes the mirror of what they are, I'm not concerned so much, we talked about this, about the narcissism involved, as that they take that as a representation of who they are, that those are the choices, and they're not, you know, and, and accepting those choices, it's just like when you go to the grocery store and you think, oh my gosh, look how many choices there are of detergent, there's this whole you know, aisle with 500 kinds of different detergent, each in their own beautiful plastic bottle with the big spout or the little spout or the HD or this. So there's 500 choices of which detergent solution you're going to have to your laundry problem. As if there were no other solutions than corporate made plastic bottle detergent to clean clothes. And there are. I mean, you can buy those little nuts from India if you want that clean it just as well and don't put phosphates in the. I mean, there's a whole mess of things. You know, just because you have more choice, which is what Kevin argues, Kevin Kelly is the great thing about technology, just because you have more choices doesn't mean you have more agency. It just means you have a wider number of choices. Or things like, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. We don't need to go, go through all of them. Um, scale is a great one for you guys. I mean, the idea of, of, of one size does not fit all. There's this sense online, and you know, Tim O'Reilly and John Battelle talk about it a lot, that everything online must scale. You know, whenever you talk to someone in business online, they're like, how is it scale? How will it scale? How will it scale up? It's got to scale. If it doesn't scale, it's like it's not real. Right? And what they decided, what, what O'Reilly decided was now we're out of Web.2, Web 2.0, now we're in Web Cubed. Right? And it, what you want to do is get away from actually doing anything and become the indexer of people who are doing stuff. It's like he finally realized what Google does. Right? But his idea is like, you don't want to be writing books, you want to be Amazon aggregating books. You want to, want to be the music store, you want to be the music, meta music store aggregating music stores. The problem with that from a postmodernist perspective is if you get in an infinite regressive loop, right? So all right, why don't I just be the aggregator of aggregators then? And then he could be the aggregator of aggregator aggregators, you know, with so on and so on. It's like, I'm going to start the incubator that incubates incubators, or the one that incubates incubator, incubating incubators. Right? You can keep going forever. The fact that you can keep going forever means that it doesn't actually work. Right? That that's actually a place that's not the creation of value. That's the extraction of value. And that's what we're looking at there. And that's a, 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 another story for another day. But that's really the incompatibility of 21st century economics with the 13th century currency operating system that we're trying to run this economy on. Right? But it's, it's, it's why we're having the stock market crash. It's why we're having the banking crash. It, it, there's a number of reasons, but it's, it's this Jack Welch idea that what you want to do is get away from having a productive business, sell off your aerospace, sell off your washing machines, don't do any of that real stuff, become a holding company or become a bank. Get closer and closer to just, if you want to make money, just get closer and closer to making money. Right? That's what I mean, and it makes sense in a society where the making of money is making of money, 
right? Where the making of money is tied to the creation of value, though, you want to do something else. And that's the beauty of what goes on here, right? Whenever you're having a positive conversation about Google, what is that conversation about? It's not about, oh, look at all the advertising revenue we've gotten. No, the positive conversation about Google is, how have we helped people create value who wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise, right? What you're doing in the best case scenario is restoring the pre-Renaissance peer-to-peer economy that was destroyed by central banking, destroyed by monopoly charters, and destroyed by really a, a, a collusion between government and a few corporations to prevent a peer-to-peer -peer economy and re-centralize economic activity, right? When you let me write a book and sell it to him without Amazon, without HarperCollins, without borrowing money from Chase or JP Morgan, you've done something really powerful, right? You haven't just disintermediated one company, you've, you've disintermediated the central economy, right? And you've restored my ability to create value without having a job. And what is a job but a legacy of this old industrial age model that was created to prevent us from just doing stuff? Right, late Middle Ages, Europe, end of feudalism. What was going on? People were doing stuff and getting rich. That's what was happening. There were merchants starting to travel around and trade. There were people developing crafts. All these people who had been peasants were now doing stuff, trading with one another, using local currencies, but transacting and getting wealthy. They were what was called the bourgeois. The aristocracy hated the bourgeois. Why? Because the more bourgeois you became, the less, the less dependent you were on centralized power, on lords and lasses, right, to give you the land to go make your food on. So what did they do? They ended the peer-to-peer -peer economy with law. That's what chartered monopolies were. No one's allowed to do any business in this industry except my friend. You want to do that business now? You work for him. That's what charter monopolies and the corporations we know today, that's what that, the code is based on that. And the second was centralized currency. You're not allowed to transact with one another unless you borrow this transaction medium from a central bank, from us, from our treasury. This was how the rich got to stay rich simply by being rich rather than creating value. And that worked for 600 years as long as we could expand the economy through other places and extract their, their value and their labor. Computer broke that, right? And you guys broke that more than most by realizing bottom up. It's sort of, there's a whole bunch of technologies that you look at from tagging, uh, from tagging and Google versus uh, original Yahoo and hierarchy, say. You know, it's, it's one is letting, letting the network and letting people in a peer to peer decentralized fashion actually create the aggregate value together, and the other is the industrial age model of extracting value from people before they've actually had the ability to recoup any of it or transact any of it themselves. When you guys are, are on target, you're doing that, and that is the most revolutionary thing to happen in 600 years, using a medium that I would argue is the biggest thing to happen in you know, 22 or 2400 years, which leads to, to some some stuff that's exciting. These are just some of the other, other rules, my little commands. They're not meant as commandments that you have to follow, but more commands that give you command over, over these technologies. Um, be yourself. I just don't like the way the net is biased towards people who are anonymous, anonymous and away from people's identities. You know, when 4chan or someone wants to come after me, how do they do that? By revealing who I am, right? By showing this is his kid, this is his house, this is his phone number, my identity, who I am is my liability. That sucks. Right? So I think the more we are present online, the more we are ourselves, the more anonymity is an aberrant behavior or the behavior for an activist is going to get killed, the better off we are. Um, social, don't sell your friends. Um, this is just an argument that the net is actually a social place. It is a social medium that has fought off many efforts to desocialize it, and that's why I think it will fight off Facebook as well. Facts tell the truth. I believe that the net is biased towards facts. Right, not always truthful facts, but towards facts. It's a non-fiction medium. I think storytelling and mythology, the, all the stuff of the branding and printing press eras don't work as well as facts. When you're trying to, even if you're trying to socially market something, what will spread about your product? Right? Will the idea that it's baked by elves in a hollow tree spread on social networks? Or will the fact that you used organic ingredients? Or will the fact that some kid in New Guinea got his fingers cut off in your cookie factory? Right? It's, it's the facts that spread. That's the way people gain social currency is by, by sharing information, even gossip. 
Um, this is just a very simple answer to the, the whole openness copyright nonsense problem is so not a problem. Right? The reason we don't steal stuff be, is because we have a social contract not to do that. Right? I want that mic. I need a mic. I'm not going to steal that mic. Not because I couldn't get away with it. I could get away with it. Probably even after saying this. I don't do it because we don't do that. Right? But we don't have any such social code online. So my, my argument for the bias of openness, yes, the net is biased towards openness, is share, do not steal. Going along with that, though, in, in a particularly Google fashion, many people feel that, as an author, I should basically share everything I write for free, comments on, online, period, no matter what. And, you know, there's this... There's this ethos as if it's like, as if by charging for the stuff I've created, I'm somehow against the boing boing Linux openness thing. And what they don't realize is that when I share my writing for free online, value is still being extracted by companies, very often you guys. Right? If, if people are accessing my data through Google indexes, Google is still advertising. Google is still extracting value from the ability to index and send people to my thing. But they're not passing that value on to me unless we enter into some interesting deal. Um, and I start putting ads on my stuff where Rupert Murdoch, for however evil and conservative and Fox Newsy he is, at least he cut me in on his take. Right? So the, the idea that... that open source and openness and free and everything, that they're all equivalent, is kind of muddled, um, is muddled in people's minds. And it goes hand in hand with this sort of deprofessionalization of content creation, the idea that we don't really need professional journalists because anyone can write a blog, right? It's like, no, that argument doesn't really hold. There's governments and corporations spending hundreds of millions of dollars to create really cogent looking public relations nodules. To, uh, to, to spit out at us. And we need professional journalists to disassemble them and understand them. You know, we can't as amateurs. We don't have the time and energy to do it. But, and then finally, program or be programmed. My idea here is just to, sh just to let people know that the programs they're using are embedded with purpose, right? Whether they know what that purpose is or not. It's not conspiratorial purpose, it's not negative purpose, it's just purpose. That these tools are not like rakes or shovels or steam engines, right? These are tools that are embedded with programs, which means they do go on. They do have biases even more powerful than the biases of the tools we use. And the biases of our technologies matter. You know, guns don't kill people, people kill people, right? But guns are more biased towards killing than pillows. Right? They're biased. Right? And each of the technologies we use are biased and they, and they go on. Right? They continue on. So my, my, my plea um, to you guys is I, I totally get that most people, that the 90% who don't want to understand media and technology currently cannot tell the difference between honest software and dishonest software. They can't tell the difference between transparency and opacity. They can't recognize ethical coding and, and uh, programs that actually are serving their interests from ones that aren't. Um, and you're moving into an increasingly competitive software marketplace where the people who hoodwink them may actually get an initial leg up on you, right? Just like a stupid fascist politician may get early interest that a non-fascist educating one won't get. But I am working hard, I am dedicating myself to getting the masses, um, if you want to call it that, to getting people to the ability where they can recognize the difference between the good stuff and the crap. Um, and, and so, so please um, don't lose hope, don't lose faith in their ability to distinguish between when you're doing it right and when you're doing it in that expedient way that you know is just going to kind of work because they're dumb. Um, in the long run, we will end up, we will end up with a smarter civilization um, as a result. 
Okay, that's probably enough for me to, to start. Do you guys have thoughts, questions? I wrote a book, it's here, it's for sale here. This is the interesting thing about Google. It's here cheaper than I can buy it from the publisher as an author, which is, I, if you guys don't buy them, I'm gonna buy the rest of them because it's, it's a better deal than I can get. Or at least stick it in your libraries. This is a nice, short, digital generation, 140 page, half a plane ride book. So you can read the book and still watch the movie. Um, and, and it's, it's uh, I mean, I like to think if McLuhan were around, it'd be the kind of way that he would treat um, digital media. And there's nobody doing it. There's just nobody, I don't know, everybody is, is so busy applying these insights to either to, to business or to the argument about is technology good or bad, that nobody's really looking at digital media as an event. What, has, what is happening to civilization now? You know, and I think that's, um, that, to me, is the, important, is the important question. This is as big as text, and things will arise from this as big as Judeo-Christianity, as big as the Industrial Age, as big as centralized currency. You know, really, what Craigslist did to the newspaper is like such a blip compared you know, to what e-currency will do to central banks, to what communication is going to do to nation states, to what uh, a peer to peer transaction is going to do to corporatist monopolies, to what long distance modeling is going to do for um, local sustainability. I mean, it's, it's we, are, we are on the edge of something so potentially great, it could make it so we don't all die in the next couple of centuries. It really could. Um, we, could, we, could we could flip this thing. And uh, I, I think people need to, need to get that. And it's not, and it's so not hard, is the thing. If they're willing just to think, for geez, half an hour, you know. Oh, there's me. Any thoughts though? Or questions, concerns? Yeah. Oh, there's a mic. Let's see if the mic is on. Yes. Uh, I have two pieces of good news for you. So one is AdSense, where you can get a little bit of funds if you publish stuff online and you don't have to publish your books, but you know, I mean, if you have a blog, you add AdSense to it and you'll get a cut of revenue. So, you know, and it's better from Google than from, who was the? Murdoch. The guy. Yeah, Murdoch. Uh, the other thing is, uh, on, on the more serious topic, I, I, I like actually your, uh, your thoughts on people actually understanding programming. I, I, I came from, you know, I, that the same generation, you know, like we used to do our own stuff and, and all that, which is something that uh, people don't do. But uh, it reminds me about uh, a transition that happened in the in the early 50s as well, when uh, people transitioned from coding machines by plugging wires and things that were utterly inefficient and and not very well mapped to the way our brains work into something that was more comprehensible. Uh, computer languages. Uh, I know of groups now that work uh, on, on transitioning, you know, like on, on doing the next phase transition, basically. The, the, the computer languages seem to be the limiting factor now. We, and, and the reason, you know, like it is purely driven by economy. I mean, there's not even, uh, you know, like a, a social push or anything like that to do this. It's just the fact that we cannot, I mean, we have more and more and more gadgets and services and everything in the world, and we're running out of programmers. I mean, the, the schools cannot produce it. So we're, we're going to see a transition really soon, and I think it may address some of the, some of the issues that, 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 that you bring yeah. on about understanding the, the technology. I mean, the thing is, when we say we are running out of programmers, I wonder, is everyone running out of programmers? Everybody. According yes. to... We, we, we run models, and, you know, like, we're going to... China doesn't have enough programmers? No. I thought they're turning out, like, a thousand for every one of ours. It, it, it takes time to train them. I mean, training, and, you know, like, and when you model the proliferation of services, gadgets, and products that are getting out, and, you know, like, how much output schools have, we're, you know, like, the... Right. Well, it's and public working. education in America is kind of, it's going to be in transition for the next 20, 30 years yeah. um, and not teaching programming anytime soon. I mean, we never taught media literacy in America. We never taught them how to watch television. So we're not going to teach them how to use computers. We're going to teach them how to use software, right? You go take a computer class in high school in America, they teach you Microsoft Office, 
right? Or they'll teach you Google Docs. I mean, great, but, but the, the answer to that, I think, is to turn computing into a counterculture. Um, so the, the, and I'm still, I'm, I've asked for my invite like three times now with different email addresses, um, but the, the app, the app builder, do you know what I'm talking about? Android yeah. app builder? Yes. We're, yeah, we're App good. Inventor. Now, if App Inventor, I mean, Android is pretty clean. I've been playing with, Android is a pretty clean, as easy as Python, if not easier, language. If the app builder it's gets It's a language, enough, that's the problem. Right. But if you can turn, I mean, if you can turn app builder into basically an object-oriented scratch-like thing that then has a, you learn all that, then you tear down another level to then how do you build those, then tear down another level to how do you build those, you're there. Google's got the, the staff to do that. I mean, how much would that take? Alan Kay could do it with a dozen people, right, in 40 years. Um, you would think Google could do it with eight people in two years. I mean, how hard is that? It's, it's been work done. Is that hard? It's, it is hard, yes, because it's a phase transition. You have to change uh, people's minds as well. It's not no, only changing the No, but kids want to make apps, though. Kids, the yeah. hunger to make an app is, is not so different from the hunger to get on American Idol. Right. It really isn't. Because kids see the apps, they see the phones, they see people using them, and they think, they really do, I could do that. You know, and once they think I can do that, it's something that Lego Mindstorms failed, right? I, I was in on that. I thought that was going to be the thing. Seymour Papert and the whole... And what did kids do? They didn't want Mindstorms, they wanted Bionicles. They wanted not even Lego, they wanted Lego that was less Lego than Lego, right? That there was less components, more just, here's what you do, here are the steps. I mean, Bionicles is anti-Lego from that perspective. But um, somehow the idea of combining, if you get an app and you put it up and you get the downloads and you get the money, you know, and you're in junior high school. I'm gonna let my colleagues now ask yeah. more questions, but uh, it, it's in that direction. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where to go. And that, that change, that phase change could happen faster than you think. I mean, look at the, the, look at the demo. Look at the demographics on the people asking for invitations. And it's going to be kind of shocking. Here. Uh, so you talked a little earlier about uh, uncritical acceptance of uh, things like Facebook. Do you see this as part of a broader cultural trend? Uh, you know, you mentioned it as being specific to technology, but I don't see it as being all that different from the way people uh, think about Coca-Cola and the Department of Defense and so on. Yeah, I think it's the same. I think it's the same exact thing. I mean, there was a great debate between Walter Lippmann and John Dewey in the early 1900s, where Walter Lippmann wrote the first books on propaganda. He was Ed Bernays' teacher, and he basically said that people are stupid, they just have pictures in their heads, they don't really know what's going on, and all we can do is get a benevolent elite to run things who then hire very clever public relations people who get the masses to be compliant. John Dewey saw this, he was an old guy, like 80 year old uh, teacher at Columbia Teachers College, and he was like, oh my God, this is crazy, and he started writing all these articles and letters saying, no, people can be educated, they can be smart enough, we just need new, a new relationship between people and the press and education and all this, and um, it fell mostly on deaf ears, and, and that's the way it's basically, it, Lippmann has been right through most of history. People look at the world uncritically and unthinkingly. To me, we have these windows of opportunity the invention of language may have been one, but the invention of text was certainly one, and the invention of digital technology is another one. We get these windows of opportunity for the other 90% to go, oh, I get it, we're all in charge of reality, you know, that, that we can actually participate in this thing. Um, and I, I don't know, I just don't know how many more of those opportunities we get. So I would argue, yes, this is the status quo, and it's going to be exacerbated by digital technology, but, um, it could just as easily be, be broken free. You know, that this, is, that this is another moment for humans to get smart. It's just hard, you know, we wanna make a living and programmers are in the employ of big companies that that's not their interest. Hi, hey. um, I had a question. I'm actually a middle school teacher that's been here for a year and will be here for a little more time. Um, and I'm working on a project that whose goal is kind of to get some of these thinking skills into students at a younger age. And one, um, one glitch in the actual 
programming, like actual coding is, you know, actually having the hardware or to do the app inventor type of stuff, you know, we don't have phones in our classroom, or whatever, for the moment. So to what extent do you feel that just the thinking skills, which we refer to as cognitive thinking, can be taught and the value of teaching them without actual hardware? We're, we're thinking that a lot of that can be done, but do you have much experience with that? A lot of it, I mean, I mean, most of my experience is with that. I write books, right? <laughs> I write books that change people's relationship to digital technology without programs. So I think, yeah, I think a heck of a lot of it can be done. I think it would be more like new media literacy than programming. Mm -hmm. You know, but you know, but how did I learn C was reading a book. I mean, I haven't used, I haven't used, there's a whole bunch of tutorials and things. And you know, I, I feel like it's certainly in terms of public school, kids have enough screen time in the real world, and it's sort of like the, the, the opportunity in the school setting is that face-to-face -face interaction. What kids need more experience with now is the kinesthetic relationship of human beings in a room together. I mean, that's, that's the thing they have the least, the, the least uh, ability to do. So I think you could get a heck of a lot of it. And then if they're going to actually learn how to program, then they should probably have the tools. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I would agree, though, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks very much for coming today. Oh, um, thanks for having me. Uh, so I actually work on books and news. Um, and so I worked in both those professions before coming here where they have things called editors. Uh, and they add value in a way that you know uh, uh, consumers can't and that the companies can't. But these people in the middle who are kind of like very talented generalists in a way. Um, and as I keep hearing in both industries about like the wave of crowdsourcing and so on, I just want to get your thoughts on whether you think that wave is so great that we will lose that kind of skilled middleman in a way that helps not only extract value but create value, um, or whether uh, we'll still have those people who can help do that. No, I think he's coming back. You know, the, the thing, what happened was, which is the shortest way to tell this story, the artificial spike in CD sales when boomers replaced their connections of records with CDs led to corporate conglomerization of media content, where big companies bought up all the CD companies thinking they would get rich. After they bought up all them and movie studios, they went to buy book publishers, thinking that this was a great source for media. What they didn't realize was that books is not a growth industry. Books is a sustainable industry. So the only way they could meet their debt structure demands was by reducing bottom line costs rather than increasing top line growth. So what they did was got rid of the people that they thought were inefficient. Those were editors. Because the editors who took time to actually read and edit books, as opposed to those who just acquired them and sold them, were looked at as the bad part of the value chain rather than the only part of the value chain. So everyone was gone from publishing except acquiring editors and marketing people, who then just justified their existence with longer and longer turnaround, more and more middlemen, more and more value extraction, and the industry got worse and worse. Those editors still exist, though. They've been spit out. The good ones are the ones who got fired, and they're now trying to work at teeny independent publishers publishing companies who can actually be enabled and empowered through peer-to-peer -peer, uh, peer -peer connect connectivity. You know, what I would want is Google Books to replace Amazon. You know, because if Google Books replaces Amazon, then I can sell my book to anyone. Here's the link. Now buy it from me. Use my PayPal. Use my Google. I'll do Google checkout. I'll give you the 5%, whatever you want. Please, just free me of that. Give me an aggregator for content that people trust, and let us just sell it to each other. Then what do I do? I hire an editor to help me with my book. And that's fine, too. I know them. They're out there. It just, the business model changes. But yeah, we, of course we need them. I haven't had an editor in, in 10, 15 years. Hey, so you know, and I've only once had the same person buy my book as, as sell it out into production. The turnover was so rapid. So we need to wrap up momentarily because we're past 1 o'clock. But truly, one of my great passions over the last 20 years has been trying to trip up Rushkoff in public and prove that he's wrong about something. So I just want to ask you one question okay. about Facebook before we end. I couldn't help noticing it. We all think about Facebook a lot, and I'm incredibly impressed with what they've done. What, that one of your commandments is be yourself. And I just wanted to ask you, is it not the very both social power and financial power of Facebook that 500 million people have actually chosen to join a social network as themselves? And isn't that interesting in a positive way? It is. But 
The only environment in which people are willing to be themselves is in the consumer environment, where they define themselves through their product purchases. The place that I'm concerned about is all the comments on every bulletin board. I mean, it's, it's right now, and it's good. Part of why Facebook works is that people are being themselves. You know, and when someone's not, or someone's sort of one of those things, you kind of don't want them on your page, or they say those ridiculous things. You can defriend them so easily. Facebook is basically just a self-moderated, I mean, what is your wall, but a self-moderated comments comments list. But you know, I, I refuse, I'm comments, I'll leave comments on my blog, but uh, you got to say who you are. You know, really you do. Unless you really are, you know, an Iranian who's going to get your head cut off for telling the truth on this, on, on my site. Right? And then, you know, it's fine. I'll let you be anonymous and I'll remove your IP address or whatever. You know. Not that they should be wasting their time on my blog if they're, if that's, you know, that shouldn't be their, their forum. But yeah, I think that's part of what that's part of what makes it work. I think people do want to be themselves in safety.